Well, some of the people fleeing those conflicts have tried to make the crossing to Europe, but it is a dangerous journey, and there's news today of yet more refugees drowning at sea. The UN says at least 239 have died in two shipwrecks off the Libyan coast. It's refugee agency saying the information was confirmed by two survivors who were brought ashore to the Italian island of Lampedusa. That means that 4,220 people have drowned so far this year trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea. Well, Stephen O'Brien is the UN Humanitarian Affairs Chief, and he joins me now in the studio to talk uh, about all of this. Thanks very much for being with us. So, lots to talk about there. Let's, let's start, first of all, with the, the situation in Iraq and the ongoing attack to, to, to retake Mosul. We were hearing there of uh, huge numbers of civilians uh, fleeing um, those areas, warnings about a humanitarian ca catastrophe. Where, where are we on that right now? Are you equipped to, to deal with this, and, and what needs to be done? Well, unusually, with the recovery of Mosul from ISIL, we have known this is likely to come for some time. So, yes, we have had a chance to prepare. We've been out raising money. We've managed to raise about 50% of what we calculate is needed. We certainly need more now because cash immediately buys you the shelters and the preparation of emergency sites to receive people as they flee. So far as they've gone through the villages and have reached the outskirts of Mosul, we've seen people, and you saw on that uh, clip, the pictures of people coming out with white flags either on foot or in vehicles uh, and going th through the villages and then r rushing towards the uh, Iraqi security forces as they are advancing and, and claiming uh, their, their, their safety and, and wanting to get into wherever they can be hosted either by host communities or by setting up camp themselves or getting into one of the shelters that have been provided by the international community or onto one of the emergency sites. So yes, at this stage we have about 60,000 prepared, 250,000 uh, sites getting ready but we calculate that there could be between one to one and a half million people who could flee but we don't know. All such military actions do produce very chaotic and unpredictable results. We don't even know which direction they may flee in. What we know is we need to be as prepared as we can, but also as nimble and as quick as we can in order to make sure we save life. And the biggest concern we have is the protection of civilians in this conflict so that as the forces advance to seek to take back Mosul, and it does look like a very tough combat, house to house, very vicious, uh, that the every, every effort should be spared to... Uh, should not be spared to make sure that innocent civilians are not caught up in this and can be protected in order for them to survive. Uh, and we mentioned there um, the more refugees uh, uh, have, have drowned uh, off the coast of, of Libya trying to make that journey into Europe. They are among so many uh, mm. that have tried to make that journey over the last um, year or so. W what should be done in terms of that? Uh, should European governments be doing a lot more uh, to help them or are they as some, as some People, they, people there believe a threat to, to Europe? Well, what's clear is that there are a number, huge numbers of people who are feeling compelled to move, who want to get away from either conflict or deep insecurity, or they want to get away from deep poverty or chronic uh, disease which are affecting where they live, whether that's from the Sahel in Africa or whether it's from Afghanistan where violence is flaring up again uh, or wherever they are coming from, they're often taking these perilous journeys. I think the first condemnation should be for the absolutely abhorrent traffickers who peddle uh, these very dangerous journeys at great cost and uh, then don't care about the fate of the people they send onto the open sea uh, and indeed the others taking very dangerous land uh, routes to try and reach countries of haven, security, whatever it may be. And I think it is important that we look, as indeed the United Nations did at a very important worldwide meeting on the 19th of September, is how do we find a better way for us to all step up to our mutual obligations to receive people in need, to process asylum seekers quickly, to make sure they're entitled to the life support and humanitarian uh, goods and services that we would all expect if we were suddenly thrust into a crisis of that uh, ourselves. And that's the very least we should expect. So yes, there is a big debate going on about the respective obligations around the world for these issues but we should be tackling the root causes which is what's driving people conflict and poverty is but, the source of it but what you're talking about there, addressing the root causes that that costs money um, and what do you say to those governments in the West particularly in Europe who don't believe that uh, money for international aid international development is is a priority for them they say we've got we've got our own problems at home what do, what do you say to that well, I say it's in everybody's interest to absolutely be part of 
what is a globalized world now. And we don't just mean globalized in terms of goods and services for, uh, for the, the private sector. We mean globalization in terms of information flows. We know wherever crises are around the world within nanoseconds and through the broadcasts, uh, uh, such as programs like this, we will know immediately. So therefore, our sense of obligation to help people in need, wherever that arises, through natural disasters or now 80% of the humanitarian needs, about 135 million people around the world tonight will need some form of humanitarian assistance, and 80% comes out of conflict. And so, yes, we have to be absolutely clear that it's in our mutual interests to actually dedicate part of those countries which have uh, tax revenues to support private charitable donations and other private sector and even civil military cooperation from time to time, particularly natural disasters, to bring every effort to bear in order to meet the humanitarian needs of people wherever they arise, however it's arisen, impartially, neutrally and independently, so that we only focus on the needs and we don't get to be partial about wanting one side of a fight to win rather than another. That is what will help create a more secure world for all of us. So it's in all our mutual interests. And that's why I think that there is a real need to continue very strongly to prosecute the case that uh, international aid, whether it's humanitarian or development, is something which is uh, of domestic interest as much as it is obviously of international. Well, let's move on to Syria then. And I, I know uh, people who follow this will still remember the remarks that you gave to the UN Security Council in New York just over a week ago, in which you said that you were incandescent with rage over the uh, council's lack of action on, on stopping the bombing in Aleppo by uh, Syrian government forces and, and the Russian forces backing them up. You called it our generation's shame. The Russian ambassador, Vitaly Churkin, had some choice words of his own in response to that, as I'm sure you remember, just, but just to, to remind our viewers, he said that if he wanted to be preached to, he'd have gone to a church and that you should save your words for your upcoming novel. Again, to quote him, when you hear that kind of language, coming from a high-level diplomat at the UN in, in such a public setting, directed at you personally, how does that make you feel? Well, at the end of the day, I have a duty and a responsibility on the facts to report to the Security Council the humanitarian circumstances, whether it's of a country or on the global need. And I absolutely rest upon the facts. I have obviously a staff who helped me prepare uh, my statements to make sure that we really do verify the facts and I stood by the facts that I introduced to the uh, Security Council in that meeting as I do at all the meetings. So as an international civil servant, a professional diplomat, it's my job not to rise to any kind of uh, personal uh, issues. Uh, of course I recognize that emotions can run high but that is not for me to engage in. What matters is to present the facts so that where we clearly around the world have political failures which are causing conflicts and if we don't have a political success at the highest body the Security Council to try and put right mm -hmm. these conflicts because they'll only have political solutions we all know through history there aren't military solutions to these things it's a political solution and there well, isn't even a humanitarian solution we well, pick let's up talk, the pieces. Let's talk about solutions and, and the lack of them at this point particularly at the UN Security Council many people are frustrated um, at, at the sort of gridlock uh, that's going on there and the perception that it's become so politicized uh, right now. Is, is that a frustration that you and your staff feel? I think everybody is frustrated that we can't find our way forward to find a political agreement that is given a unanimous uh, approach that is likely to therefore yield the result that we want, which is to find a political settlement that's going to at last give the people of Syria the chance to have the kind of life that you and I would expect, which is to both be allowed to survive and to thrive and to be able to uh, have that sense of security which we all expect to, to live in. And so, uh, yes, there's shared frustration everywhere, but the question arises, there's no alternative. However much we're knocked back, however much we're deterred, and particularly as humanitarians, with emergency relief and needing to get that through safe, unimpeded, wherever it is, we need to never be knocked back. We need to be undeterred and to call out the facts, and when we say that what the facts are on the ground to try and appeal to the consciences of all those involved in these discussions to find a way forward to find agreement and even where it's not found to try and try again because it is the only option we've got there isn't a higher diplomatic body of the world we have to try and make the security council work and on that note we'll leave it good to speak with you uh, Stephen O'Brien UN humanitarian affairs chief thanks very much for being with us thank you